Unless any concerns? Okay, great. I see the little prompt, um, Alexandra, thank you. So thanks for that. Uh, we'll be sharing this around afterward. Um, a little bit about the AHEAD NC uh, platform. The learning community that we have uh, been fortunate enough to build really started a few years ago. And um, it's uh, designed to lift up good work that's happening to highlight models and tools that are being leveraged in various places uh, to um, promote and expand equitable economic um, development. And really to provide a space where we can share these things, talk about them and try to move ideas. Uh, we are meeting roughly uh, every quarter and um, the Justice Center is happy to sort of um, hold this space. And uh, we've been joined by a number of uh, uh, folks with expertise that can really educate us. So uh, today we're focusing on how the American Rescue Plan uh, can support economic mobility uh, and equitable, de equitable development. And we're gonna focus on workers. So with that, um, I'd like to turn it to Patrick McHugh, again, our research manager, who can share uh, a little bit about the state of working in North Carolina. So without further ado, Patrick, we'll move it over to you. All right, thank you much. Um, well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm gonna try to run through some stuff really quick. This is part of a larger report that we did really looking at what are the barriers that working people face and getting back into the labor force. Um, you know, I think we have to acknowledge that one of the central arguments that has been happening over the last several months has been uh, why employers report having a hard time finding people to do work. Um, and we've seen a lot of um, bogus arguments that it's things like unemployment insurance and government benefits and things like that that are keeping people from needing to work. And a bunch of folks would just rather take unemployment insurance than, uh, than get a job. And I think we all know that that's not really the case in the vast majority of instances. And so we wanted to document uh, some of the, the barriers that are currently frustrating people's ability to get back to work and the sorts of things that American Rescue Plan dollars can go a long way towards addressing uh, if used wisely at the state and local level. Uh, so the first thing just to note is that there are hundreds of thousands of people in North Carolina that would like to work but are currently unable to work because of one of a series of barriers. These are not all of them that we looked at in the report, but these were the, the barriers that were reported as the chief barrier by the most people. So needing to care for children, concern about uh, getting or spreading the coronavirus, and this was before the Delta variant sort of really reared its head, um, needing to care for an elderly person or lacking transportation for work. Uh, and so if you can, you can see on this that there's, you know, you put those together and there's hundreds of thousands of people that would like to be working but are prevented from doing so because of uh, these, these types of barriers and getting back to work. All right, next slide, please. Uh, I think we all know that many of these barriers are not equally distributed, that many people of color and women, uh, low-income workers face these sorts of barriers at a much higher rate than other folks, and so that putting investments into helping people overcome these kinds of barriers will both help our economy, but more importantly, help the people that need support the most uh, and build a more equitable uh, state, uh, hopefully on the, on the far side of COVID. Uh, so this is just looking at one specific instance that I think we'll talk more about later, with, and that is childcare, uh, that the burden of providing childcare falls, uh, unfortunately, far more heavily on women and low-income people. Um, I also recently just saw um, some other data that, that show that women are much more likely to have left the labor force over the last several months, and childcare is certainly one of those chief reasons. Uh, next slide. Uh, another thing that's been an issue throughout uh, COVID-19 uh, and, and beyond is the lack of paid sick leave. Um, and this means that there are many people that uh, unfortunately were essentially forced to go to work while they were sick and got their colleagues sick, got customers sick, um, and that contributed substantially to the spread of COVID-19. Um, that if paid sick leave had been truly universally accessible, 
uh, to everybody in North Carolina, all workers in North Carolina, we could have avoided thousands of COVID-19 cases per week in some parts of the of the pandemic. Uh, and as we see, people are still reporting concern about returning to a workplace uh, when there aren't sufficient protections in place, when paid sick leave is not uh, universally available, uh, and when there's not enough sort of oversight to ensure that employers are doing right by their employees, making sure that they are providing them a safe workplace in the middle of a global pandemic. All right, next slide, please. <clears throat> So this is just something I think has gone widely uncommented on and is a really important part of the story about why employers report having a hard time finding workers. Uh, if you look at surveys of people that were not working in the last several months, there's a huge uptick in the number of people who report being retired. Uh, and I'm sure some of those folks were retired by choice and may not have had a choice and were sort of essentially forced into retirement. Um, but one of the things I just want folks on this call to take with them into the conversations they're having in their communities is that for all that so many conservative politicians and business interests have tried to deflect attention onto government programs like unemployment insurance, far, far more people in North Carolina report having entered retirement than were taking unemployment insurance benefits when the federal supplementary benefits expired uh, in August. So. There's a huge untold story here that has a much larger role to play in uh, quote unquote labor shortage uh, than, uh, than some of the government programs. And next slide. And lastly, I just wanna note that again, we've had this running debate going on over months with conservative politicians saying that unemployment insurance is this big boogeyman that's keeping people from work. Well, last Friday, the first month of labor market data, of employment data came out since the supplementary federal benefits expired. Uh, and it showed, you know, and if conservative sort of pundits and politicians and business leaders were to be believed, there should have been this giant wave of people re-entering the labor market. Uh, and what we actually got was the smallest monthly job gain since the start of COVID-19. Um, I do want to underscore that's only one month of data. So don't, you know, I don't read too terribly much into one month, but we've been, hearing some very strong claims for a long time that all we have to do is get rid of unemployment insurance benefits and suddenly there's going to be hundreds of thousands more people coming back in the labor force and that's just flat out not true. Um, I'll just say again uh, as I close up there's a lot more in the report that shows additional barriers that uh, American Rescue Plan dollars could be used to help overcome and provides more detailed breakdown of uh, by race and gender and income level rural urban um, who is experiencing these kinds of barriers and who could benefit from uh, wide use of American Rescue Plan dollars. I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks, Patrick. Um, it's great to be with you all. I, um, and, and as I said earlier, Alexandra Sirota with the Budget and Tax Center. And I'm gonna speak a little bit to the American Rescue Plan opportunity, primarily, I think, Building on what Patrick talked about, the, the opportunity here is to think about an inclusive recovery, one where people, um, every person has a chance at financial security and well being. And one of the things that is very clear um, in the data on what happened during COVID 19 is that the status quo is not an acceptable outcome coming out of this pandemic that so many of our systems failed to support families, failed to support the health and well-being of workers, failed to include all workers in good paying jobs that were safe, um, and that the opportunity really is right now to rebuild with equity in mind um, at the forefront. And the American Rescue Plan opportunity has the potential to be transformational by sheer scale of the dollars, we could be driving um, these investments into equitable opportunities and community communities, uh, investments that really get people what they need. State fiscal recovery funds coming to North Carolina total more than $5 billion and to municipalities and counties across the state more than $3 billion. These are dollars that are flexible in purpose. I'll talk a little bit about that. And we've talked about it before in this space, 
but they present opportunities where revenue hasn't been lost to really drive towards systemic solutions that make sure the damage of the pandemic um, has taught us something about how to build systems better for the future. In addition to these dollars, there are numerous funding streams coming in for targeted programs and services, but the focus today will be really on the fiscal recovery funds. Um, there is really strong language in the American Rescue Plan legislation around equity and inclusion, and I just wanna lift those up for you all as you're having conversation. The legislation and subsequent guidance really set out an expectation that governments will pursue community input in spending decisions. Local governments are specifically encouraged by Treasury to engage underrepresented and disadvantaged groups. And finally, eligible spending purposes should take into consideration the disproportionate impacts of the public health emergency on um, geographies and the economy. So there's a real opportunity here to take the language and the intent of the American Rescue Plan and move our state forward and practicing more equitably uh, the work of making policy and investment decisions. I wanted to lift up a few models because we're here to talk specifically about employment equity. And a lot of times that hasn't been necessarily the focus of American Rescue Plan conversations. And yet workers are such a central part of what happened during the pandemic. Those who not just lost their job, but went to work every day um, amidst the pandemic and continue to go to their jobs every day. And so figuring out how to shift our systems to get to more equitable employment outcomes is gonna be critical. There are some models that I think are represent exciting um, opportunities, particularly around wages and benefits. The expansion of paid sick days in Maryland and Pennsylvania provide a good model for really addressing this issue that Patrick pointed to um, that we know is true when people aren't able to take time off. Um, that presents challenges, not just for their well-being, but for the broader community's well-being. We also saw some models being put forward in Cincinnati, Ohio, that increased workplace monitoring and legal support for workers who faced unsafe workplace conditions um, using American Rescue Plan dollars. And then finally, reemployment services have been a huge focus of um, American Rescue Plan models across the country and particularly focusing on apprenticeships and high demand credentialing getting people into careers that are family sustaining wage that offer family sustaining wages and good um, career mobility. So these are some of the models that we think are exciting, but we're um, excited as well to share some additional tools and I'll turn it now to my colleague, Danny, to share some of those with you. Hi everyone. Thank you so much for being with us today. I'm just going to briefly introduce a tool that's being used nationwide um, to create more inclusive communities for immigrants and refugees. Um, we see this as an important conversation in the context of workforce development and building more inclusive workplaces across North Carolina. I'll add some of the detail from these slides into the chat so that you can access it um, more easily. And then after I summarize this tool, I'll also let you know how you can get more involved or send your, your colleagues and friends uh, to get more involved in this work statewide. Um, we're gonna look at um, the Welcoming Standard 2.0 that comes from an organization called Welcoming America. It really has seven sections that can really serve uh, local communities and local governments as um, a way to set goals uh, for moving this conversation on inclusion forward. It can actually serve as a to-do list for local communities and uh, stakeholders to take on different responsibilities in building more inclusive communities. It can serve as a checklist or it might be kind of the backbone of a report card type format as we see our communities moving into more welcoming and more inclusive um, practices for immigrants and refugees. 
Um, there are seven areas of the checklist. And then as you drill down, each one gets more detailed with very specific recommendations about what can be accomplished in the local community. Because we're focused on workers today, I'm just gonna lift up some examples from two areas, the economic development area and the equitable access area. If we could go to the next slide, please. So in the economic development arena, we can um, focus on high quality employment, not just the jobs that quote unquote, other people don't wanna do for immigrants and refugees, but really high quality employment that our community members deserve. Um, accessing additional education and the skills and degrees, the certifications that are needed. What we've seen in North Carolina is General Assembly in the last session is both a harmful bill, I'll put these details in the chat for you, a harmful bill, House Bill 29, that would have further restricted access to professional licenses for immigrants. But we've also seen a positive bill, House Bill 540, that would um, create a study commission to look at ways to encourage inclusion of refugees in the workforce. Um, we see here also that um, state and local workforce agencies can be encouraged to work more with immigrant and refugee communities and increase access. Um, more work that's more intentional with local employers, chambers of commerce, and economic development agencies. I feel like in some parts of our state, that work is just beginning, and we'd like to see uh, more bridges being built for immigrant and refugee inclusion. Um, we can build more welcoming work environments where people face less discrimination, um, and that they are fully, they're able to thrive in the workplace and bring all of their experience. And then also supporting immigrant business owners and entrepreneurs, because we've seen that that's a really important part of North Carolina's economy. Can we move to the next slide? Looking at equitable access at the local level, one of the key things we always stress is meaningful language access. That means interpretation and translated materials, high quality information so that immigrants and refugees who are learning English can be included in these conversations and the decisions that affect their lives. Information about government services needs to be disseminated widely through trusted partners like nonprofit organizations and social groups uh, like mutual aid groups. Um, we need access to healthcare services, housing, nutritious food and transportation to be equitable for immigrants and refugees. And there are a lot of steps that local governments can take. Um, navigating the legal system is something that can be very challenging for our communities. And so local governments have a role to play in supporting the legal, um, the legal assistance that people need. Digital inclusion, as we know how important the internet and other ways of connecting digitally are so important now and will be into the future. And then financial saving and wealth building programs will actually take us further down the road towards equitable inclusion of immigrants and refugees. Next slide, please. So we wanna invite you to, um, to get more involved in this work with our project, the Immigrant Refugee Rights Project at the Justice Center. We're already working with some partners on these issues. If you would like to um, fill out the brief form online, we'll get back to you with how you can join us for the inclusive workplaces effort that we're doing, that we're working on with other partners. And then if you really want to bring the welcoming standard, this level of detail, um, this kind of checklist or report card format to your local community, please send a message to welcomingnc at gmail.com and we'll follow up with you uh, for more information on how we might be able to collaborate and work together on that. Again, I'll place this information in the chat so that it's more easily accessible and thank you. Thank you, Danny. Uh, and thank you, Alexandra and Patrick for the, um, those models and uh, the analysis, very helpful. Uh, we'll move now to Anna and Claremont to start the uh, panel discussion. Sure, absolutely. Um, I'm Anna Pardo, I'm a co-director of the Workers' Rights Project um, with Claremont here at the Justice Center. Uh, I was just going to quickly introduce, um, we have a, a panelist of three local folks um, doing awesome work um, in the Triangle and elsewhere in North Carolina. So I'll just quickly uh, go through introductions. So Janelle Croxton is a labor organizer whose skills were sharpened by the many brilliant freedom fighters in Durham, North Carolina. 
She's currently the North Carolina Organizing Director of the National Domestic Workers Alliance, and she leads the recruitment, membership building, campaign work, and movement building of Black care and domestic workers in our state to win protections and improvements at the workplace and in their lives. Her work is driven by the belief that engaging in worker struggle rooted in racial and gender justice is the pathway towards our collective liberation. Drew Dahl is the coordinator of reconciliation and reentry ministries for the Religious Coalition for a Nonviolent Durham. Drew has lived uh, experience with the North Carolina criminal justice system and participates with Durham CAN and other local organizing efforts to change Durham for good. Drew is a graduate of High Point University. Um, Italo Medalias is a first generation immigrant from Lima, Peru, who moved to North Carolina when he was nine years old. Italo serves as, as the current chair of the Durham Con Durham County Boxing and Wrestling Commission and chair of the Durham Mayor's Hispanic Latino Committee. Um, during the summer of 2020, Idalo served on the Durham City Council COVID-19 Task Force's Immigration and Refugee Roundtable. Idalo is currently a final year law student at North Carolina Central University. Thanks for being here with us, y'all. We've got some prepared questions for you. I think Claremont, do you wanna put the first question? I thought they were each going to start by just talking a little bit about their projects. You're absolutely right about that. <laughs> um, so maybe we should call on someone to start. Yeah, Cece, would you mind starting? Trying to find the mute button. Yes, I can start. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, Claremont. Um, and welcome, everybody. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm Cece. And as Anna said, I'm the North Carolina Organizing Director for the National Domestic Workers Alliance. And we are a nationwide and also locally based membership organization um, that represents household and care workers, namely direct care um, and home care workers and child care providers as well. Um, and we've been movement building in North Carolina since 2016. Um, and are continuing on that work. And some of this ARP funding and investing in our industries has been a major focus of our work this year. Um, and so I wanna kind of bring it back to our journey up into you know, really engaging with these local ARP funds. Um, and what we really set out to do this year in particular is really think about the pandemic and how it's had a major impact on all of us working people in particular and that this state of emergency has you know, impacted us in negative ways, but also opened the door to many um, long-term transformational opportunities with the increased attention and focus and also um, the increased investment in a lot of these essential workforces. Um, and so we've been really trying to hone in on that in 2021 um, and continue our work of recovering from the pandemic and creating something better once we come out of it. Um, and so this work really started this year um, with a role I had on the um, Durham uh, Recovery Renewal Task Force, which is a city co county collaboration to think about how Durham would um, move um, in this phase of the pandemic um, and really address some of the issues that were coming up in different uh, sectors, di different demographics um, of the county and the city of Durham. Um, and I was there specifically to, you know, think about how we can address recovery and renewal for workers. Um, and so worked alongside the Durham Workers' Rights Commission, which is made up of rank and file union members. And we launched a survey of Durham workers to really get a sense of the conditions at work, uh, financial circumstances that workers were going through, um, how they were utilizing the city and the county resources, and then getting a sense of their ideas for what recovery would look like for workers. Um, so we're able to engage over a thousand Durham workers in that survey and then conducted a town hall afterwards in which we came up with a number of ideas that we've moved on to this next round of uh, putting formal proposals together for the local ARP funds. Um, and some of those ideas were around things that the city was already doing. So um, increasing support for rental assistance and eviction diversion, um, a premium pay for the city workers, um, which were happy, you know, happened um, in the city of Durham, and then also a worker relief fund. Um, and with that, you know, we've evolved 
those issues with some of the issues that are really pertinent for our industries in NDWA, um, namely childcare, which is something that um, we haven't seen as much opportunity on the statewide level. And so we thought it would be a really good opportunity to think about these funds that are you know, really accessible to us um, and to move forward some of those priorities that we had started on the state with a bunch of partners um, and providers and childcare workers. Um, and we wanted to really take the opportunity to make Durham one of those model places where childcare child care could really thrive. And so there was two ideas that came out of that um, and it was shaped by our base. And then also, as I said, the work that we had been doing on the statewide level. Um, and with that, we really addressed how childcare has been foundational to our economic um, stability and our economic recovery and that uh, childcare has both impacted workers who are not in childcare and also the workforce who do childcare. Um, and so we wanted to really take that and create two really robust proposals that we thought would really transform the childcare system. Um, and so the first one that we have was expanding and building the supply of family childcare homes. Um, and for folks who are not familiar, family childcare um, is when providers have a home, home based center where they're bringing children in to nurture them and teach them. Um, and this has been really crucial to um, working people. Um, family childcare is one of the only forms of childcare that actually provides after hours care. Um, and we know that during the pandemic, family child care um, centers were less likely to close than the bigger centers. Only 5% of them actually closed throughout the pandemic. Um, and so it was really important to, you know, focus in on family child care and build up that pipeline. And so what we proposed was um, turning friends, family, and neighbor care, which is informal child care, into licensed family child care, giving them the resources and mentorship over um, 18 months in order for them to pursue that licensure um, and to you know get the technical skills and also the financial resources to do so. Um, our second idea was a guaranteed income for family child care homes um, who serve subsidy kids. And those were really crucial throughout the pandemic um, because they did not close. Um, and we know that when family child care homes take subsidy kids, they're usually taken at a loss because it's not equivalent to the cost of care. And so what we're proposing is that um, we have grants available to family child care homes who are, who are delivering um, care to subsidy kids and that we're making up for that gap between what the cost of care is and what subsidy is. Um, and that, that, that amount is not based off of some of the really restrictive uh, ways that family child care uh, subsidy grants are, are doled out and that uh, we're guaranteeing a level of income for those family child care providers that you know have seen a lot of instability when it comes to subsidy and have seen a lot of instability in general with the fluctuating uh, capacity that the pandemic has impacted. Um, and so I can answer questions later. I know I'm running out of time, but you know we really wanted to put family child care homes as you know, a proposal for Durham to really um, build up the stability of child care in, in the city and the county and make sure that families who need care are able to access it and people who are giving care are able to stay in the field, which is a, you know, a major issue that you know, have been competing for many, many, many years. Um, but we know that with additional state investment that we can really address those issues um, and create a childcare system that actually works for everyone. So I'll stop there. Awesome, thank you, CC. Uh, next, uh, can we hear from you, Drew? Sure. There we go. Finding unmute is always a challenge. Uh, so a little bit about the coalition uh, first. When you come home from prison, there are many, many, many people who want to tell you what to do, whether it's probation officers, case managers, substance abuse counselors. Uh, you have a lot of people who uh, know what you ought to be doing. That's not us. Uh, what the coalition does 
is, uh, at least in reentry, is we put teams of community members, just folks from the community, uh, generally three to five, and we partner them up with one person coming home from prison. And our only goal in that is to become really good friends. Because what we found over the 15 years of doing this is uh, nobody wants to be told what to do. None of us like that. What we want to be able to do is have conversations with people that care about us. And through those conversations, maybe figure out what we ought to do. And so that's what we're about is being really, really good friends and developing relationships and pretty much everything the coalition does, whether it's reentry, uh, hope and healing circles, vigils for families who have uh, lost a loved one to violence, restorative justice, all of that is based around building relationships with people so they feel part of the community. Uh, so when you talk about specifically what we're doing, what we did in the pandemic, is uh, in May of 2020, uh, which feels like, like decades ago now, uh, but May of 2020, uh, I was sitting in a meeting with Durham Can with the, uh, with the DA. And they were talking about an initiative where they were going to look at folks in prison who were older and uh, had been in a very long time and generally were ill and work towards getting them home through motions of appropriate relief. And they actually did that. We've got you know 30 or 40 people uh, over the course of the year that came home through that program. Well, that's great. But the question was, as somebody who does a reentry, well, how are you going to care for those people once they get home? And the DA's office said, well, that's not really our issue. We're just worried about getting them home. So the problem is during the pandemic, the city shut down and the county shut down and a lot of service providers shut down. And so for the people normally coming home, it was hard to find services. Add people coming home who are sicker uh, and older and have, have specialized housing needs uh, for a lot of them. That's a real challenge. And so what we started doing at that point was gathering weekly. Uh, and actually the blessing of the pandemic was supervisors and managers were working from home and didn't generally sign in. So it was the people that had their feet on the ground that were actually doing the work uh, that got to talk together. And at least for the reentry community in Durham, uh, over, the, over the year or year and a half of the pandemic, uh, we have built a much stronger and more interconnected uh, reentry program. And it's working really well, but what we found out of that is there are some holes that need to be fixed. And so what we're hoping to do with the uh, rescue plan money is to first build out that network that is currently working. So uh, I don't know how familiar a lot of you are with peer support, but uh, we've started to develop criminal justice involved peer support specialists in Durham. We've got a pretty good base, but we want to provide full-time living wage or better than living wage uh, employment. And we wanna focus those employments on areas where we're still having trouble. So for example, the state releases people who are old and sick and takes the position that the day we release them, we are no longer responsible for their medical care. Now, we may have taken care of them for 20 years, and we've given them medicine, and they're really not sure what they take or why they take it. But we released them. It's now all on them. So fortunately in Durham, we have a program, uh, formerly incarcerated transition, that handles that kind of chronic medical uh, condition for folks coming home. But as you can imagine, they're overwhelmed. So we want to uh, put a new peer support specialist in there. We want to bring a peer support specialist to work specifically on housing. Uh, because as the housing market has gone insane in Durham, uh, it becomes increasingly hard for people to afford housing. I've got three guys right now that are ready to move out of transitional housing, 
but the cheapest one bedroom I can find for them is 15 to $1,800. Well, that's not affordable. So we need to work on increasing affordable housing and accessible housing. Because unfortunately, some of our affordable housing is not accessible to people with criminal justice backgrounds. Uh, we, want to, we also want to increase the supply of peer support specialists. So we want to train 12 new peer support specialists over the next uh, couple of years. We also want to create within North Carolina a criminal justice focused peer support certification. Uh, Texas has one, Virginia has one, North Carolina does not. And we wanna take some of those funds and create a uh, peer support that's focused on criminal justice. Uh, and I think that's probably my time. So I'll stop and I can answer questions later. Thanks, Drew. Um, sorry, Anna, I'm jumping in for you. <laughs> Eats Do you want to go ahead and share with us? Of course. Um, and Clermont, is it, is it okay if I share my screen? Yes, hopefully you should be able to do that. If not, uh, maybe Adam can jump in with technical assistance. Perfect. Let me see if it works here. Can you all see that? Yes. yes. Perfect. Yes. All right. Let me get this going. So I promise this is not going to be super long. Uh, I, this just helps me get my thoughts in order. Um, so hi, everybody. Uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Danny, for the invitation, Adam, for hosting the space. Um, and also, I mean, I, I really just want to shout out the North Carolina Justice Center. Um, ever since I've been with the Hispanic Latino Committee, uh, the, the Justice Center has been such an amazing partner. Um, Claremont, I mean, you, you, you came uh, to our meeting, uh, I think, when was it, like a year ago, right in the middle, dead set in the middle of COVID, trying to figure out how it is that we can help, um, you know, the, 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 the really terrible disaster that was happening in Durham in mid-2020. Um, you know, I think uh, uh, all, all of us that are, that are presenting today uh, look back at, you know, the middle of 2020, and if we were, you know, on the street doing the work, it, it just, it, it, it wasn't good, right? It was a very bad time for everybody. Um, and, and, and I really want to thank everybody for being able to host, host a space to, to talk about, you know, what, what our lessons were from that time and how we can move forward and, and, and get this recovery uh, in the right ship. Um, because I think that the recovery right now, I think most people would, would agree, you know, it's, it's moving forward, but, but, but we have a lot of work to do. So uh, I'll use my five minutes to talk a little bit about bottom-up democracy. Um, and how leading the recovery is not just about, you know, I think a lot of our folks that are very knowledgeable about, uh, you know, the data and the, 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 the uh, you know, all, all the, the specialty areas that are necessary to be able to move forward from the pandemic. Those things are incredibly necessary and, 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 and we need to make sure that, that everybody's skills are, are garnered in the same direction. But there's always one section of the population that is typically forgotten, and that is the people. So uh, let's talk a little bit about how we can get the people involved in this recovery uh, and how maybe some cities, some, some cities and some municipalities can maybe invest a little bit of the uh, American Rescue Plan uh, into uh, types of things like the Durham Mayor's Hispanic Latino Committee, like the Workers' Rights Commission that uh, is ran by residents and, and, and offers citizen-led solutions. So firstly, let's, let me just tell you a little bit about the Hispanic Latino Committee. Um, uh, it's been around since, you know, the early 2000s around there, I think 2005. Historically, it was made up of people uh, that were leaders in the community, right? Nonprofit leaders, business owners, uh, you know, deans of universities, um, uh, CEOs, things like that. And th what this committee was meant to do was be a voice and a liaison for the mayor of Durham uh, around Hispanic and Latino issues. So some trailblazers came around maybe in 2000, uh, the, the, you know, 2015, 2016, around there. Um, and with the help of the newly elected uh, Javiera Caballero, the first uh, Latina councilwoman in, in Durham, um, and in, in, the, in, in, in the state, uh, they were able to transition this committee uh, into a new iteration. And rather than having, uh, you know, business leaders and, and, and folks that already have quite a lot of uh, power and, and a voice in the community, they decided to transition that into a citizens committee. How do we bring people from the community that will bring ideas that are that are from the grassroots? 
So that's what happened uh, in 2020. That's when uh, I was appointed to the city council, 12 others of us. And we were thrown into a room in January 2020, and we had no idea what was going to happen because in February, around February, we figured out this is going to be an issue. COVID-19 is going to be an issue in the Latino community. And in February, we were still trying to figure out what really was going on. Um, but then as the year went on, um, things got really bad. Things got really, 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 really bad, and I think if you were, if you're, uh, you know, acquainted with Latino people in, or Latinx people in the uh, in Durham in the Triangle, uh, it, you know, you, you you probably know somebody that at least had COVID or even that lost their lives. I know several people that uh, I work with uh, uh, in the community that are are not here anymore uh, and were here before COVID, right? So. So these are things that were really hitting folks incredibly hard. People were losing their jobs. It was just a complete mess. And then in the middle of Durham, uh, also, there was, in, in the middle of COVID, there was water shortages. So people weren't able to pay their water bills. So, you know, there was an administrative error that people were getting charged like triple. So things were really spiraling out of control. And what, what we decided to do as a brand new committee of citizens that have never really been involved in, in, in a city committee or knowing really what to do, the first thing that we did was we formed a COVID-19 response task force. Um, and very early in the pandemic, uh, when we started seeing just, you know, th there were no news, uh, 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 you know, no, there was no news out about, you know, uh, Latinos, Latinx, Hispanic people being involved or be, being in, infected in, in incredibly high rates. But from our own and others here, Italo. I mean, and, and, and we started noticing like, n none of the, uh, the notices were in, in, in Spanish. None of the none of the the COVID things that that, that that folks like wear a mask and social distancing. None of it was in Spanish. So we decided to send him a letter with some requests to just have some bare minimums in Durham to be able to set some some uh, uh, at least some benchmarks as to uh, not letting people fall through the cracks. So you know we 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 gave some requests of a bilingual hotline for folks that were getting door to door scammed. There were literally people walking around trying to say, you know, we have some pills that you can take for COVID and people that are undocumented that, you know, a lot of times don't speak English were uh, getting scammed. So we needed to do that. Uh, as I mentioned before, public notices in English and Spanish, getting a city website that provides data in multiple languages and a Spanish language town hall. I'll speed up a little bit because I know I'm running out of time. Um, and we did accomplish quite a lot of those things. Um, so we, we got a De Vuelta al Ruedo, which was a multilingual town hall that happened. Some folks on the call were right now were involved in this. Um, and it wasn't just in Spanish. We had it in Swahili. We had it in a few other languages. Um, all public notices were immediately duplicated in English and Spanish. And uh, thank goodness, this past year, we just hired a language access coordinator for the city of Durham, thanks to the advocacy of Councilwoman Caballero, the Immigrant Refugee Roundtable, and the Hispanic Latino Committee. Uh, the city of Durham now has this ability. And Durham has also hired Tilde, a cooperative that, that, that does incredible interpretation services. This one, I also wanted to highlight a little unsuccessful thing that happened. Uh, I don't know if anybody remembers, I think it was last year that uh, the, the, the Durham County Sheriff released a picture, I believe it was on Twitter, uh, of them. They bought a new car, like a brand new ghost car that was worth like, I think it was around like $17,000, something like that. And it was in the middle of COVID when people started uh, getting kicked out of their houses and things like that. So the, the committee decided we want to write a letter to the sheriff and ask him to sell the ghost car and donate that money to rent relief. It was unsuccessful. It didn't work. Uh, but at least we tried. Uh, and a lot of community organizations signed on. But then we also realized that there are some sometimes uh, some community organizations that will not be comfortable with things like these. So this is another thing that you kind of need to think about when you have citizens-led committees. Now, last thing that I want to talk about we are in our second year right now, uh, our second executive committee uh, of this people-led, citizen-led committee. And this is the first year that we can really just kind of put our foot on the ground, not put COVID be behind us, keep working on COVID, but start moving the work of this committee forward so that we can uh, speed up a, a good recovery, an inclusive recovery, and move past a recovery. So we, for, for our goals for the end of the year, we're hoping to set up a whistleblower system for Hispanic and Latino people 
uh, this the 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 idea for this is to, to for it to be a worker hotline, and we've already had a couple of people that have reported discrimination, uh, racism in the workplace, and and we're you know we were able to get those folks in front of the the mayor and and a few members of the city council. Translating city ordinances to Spanish, we have so many people come to us that said, "Hey, I don't speak English, and I'm expected to follow the law, but I don't know what the law says." So uh, we you know something as simple as that. It comes up from having these citizen-led committees that actually have to follow the law and 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 and, and you know be be uh, affected by these things. So I'm completely out of time, folks. But one last thing that I wanted to add is that we're currently developing a a volunteer translation program for legal clinics because, as most of us know, undocumented people are not eligible for federal government relief. So in order, so right now with the mass eviction crisis that's happening right now, I mean it, it's it's really bad in Durham. Already starting to be really bad. Undocumented people have to go to clinics, and we went to one of the clinics the other day, and somebody was there in Spanish with cash in his hand, trying to hire a lawyer, but he didn't know English. So uh, there was nobody in the legal clinic that could translate for him. Nobody knew what was going on. So that was another need that we need to fill. And now we're hoping to get interpreters into the NCCU legal clinic and the Duke University legal clinic, so that folks can at least have the chance for legal representation. So I apologize. That was super uh, long. Uh, I'm done. These are the three things that if, if municipalities want to implement a, a citizen-led committee, it should be resident-led. Hope, please offer stipends and please offer them autonomy. The mayor should not be dictating uh, to, to the residents what to do, but the residents should be uh, liaising with the mayor. That is it. Thanks. I apologize. Thank you. Thanks, Itzla. Thank if you, you can Yellow. stop, share, and... Um, it was great hearing from all three of you. It did take up uh, more time than we had allotted. So I'm gonna um, not ask every question we had planned and I'll just start with a, a kind of more summary one, which is what advice do you all have for other groups or community members who are trying to figure out how to leverage American Rescue Plan funding? Um, and I'll go ahead and kick it back to CC if you um, are comfortable responding first. Yeah, um, I would say my advice for groups that are looking to leverage these dollars is that um, make sure the proposals that you are putting forth can be long term. I think that's that's the key. We don't want temporary solutions. We don't want um, funding that goes towards a project that will end um, pretty immediately and not have impacts on how systems are delivered or how working people, you know, experience these systems. And so if we're thinking about this pot of money and understanding that there probably is future money coming somewhere, we don't know when, we don't know how much, we don't know for what, um, we want to be able to get it right the first time and use it towards something that can really build up whatever it is that you are um, seeking to build up um, and that that can be translated into many, many years down the line. Thanks, that's really helpful. Um, what about you, Drew? Uh, yeah, I absolutely agree. Sustainability has got to be part of whatever planning you're doing. Because uh, for example, in our case, we don't want to hire uh, four new peer support specialists and after two years say, well, you, you know, you're done. Uh, so, uh, yeah, sustainability. And then also, I think it's critically important that effective voices are part of the development of any program. Uh, whatever we're doing, the people that have been impacted need to be the ones uh, helping make the decisions about what we're going to do. Um, Ifla? Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, I think uh, another thing on top of sustainability and having, uh, you know, I guess a, a, a people-led democratic way to develop these programs, I think, um, I think making sure that that money gets directly into people's pockets is incredibly important right now. Um, whether it be, uh, you know, for I, I don't know if, if, if you know, we, we, we want to make sure that, that it's directed towards something like housing or toward food or toward employment or things like that. But I think that the American Rescue Plan dollars, um, one of the things that we noticed the first time that they, or the, the, the first time that federal funding came around, that the money just disappeared, right? And that, that's, I think, what, what, what Chanel was talking about, that a lot, of, a, a lot of folks did receive services, but then when the money ran out, a lot of folks came back and it just, the, the, there, there wasn't anything else to do. So we have to rely a lot on our mutual aid. 
So sustainability, making sure that it's democratic and uh, making sure that, that it goes directly, I think, to people's pockets is, is key. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so at this point, you were a little behind in schedule, wanted to make sure we had time for questions from folks who are participating from the community. So go ahead and popcorn or you can put them in the chat. Okay, we have one, we have a second question we could ask if there are no questions from the audience. Um, let me pull it up. Claremont, do you have it handy? Sure. Um, what, and for the three of you, if, if any of you just wanna pop in on this, what barriers have you had to under overcome to fit your project or your proposal within the constraints of the funding? Um, I, I can jump in real quick. I think you know that th there there's a, a, a an, an interesting plan going on right now in Durham about um, uh, guaranteed income. So that that's being uh, I, I think worked through in in the city council. I know that one of the most obvious things that I want to shout out is the the limitations of Dylan's rule and preemption on our cities. Right. I think that that's one of the biggest barriers that we have to do any any kind of change that is incredibly necessary. Um, and that needs to be changed, I think, before we can, if, if, if you know, if, if Dylan's rule wasn't here when we were able to implement these federal dollars, I think that would take away a lot of restraints. So that's one of the biggest things that I want to shout out. Preemption is just a, a nightmare and a, and, and a thorn, I think, in everybody's side. Yeah, I'll second that. Um, Cece and Drew, did mm -hmm. either of you want to share anything? Uh, the only real barrier we've had is waiting for the site to open up so we could actually start dropping the application in. Um. Yeah, I, I, I think the, the barriers that we're working through is trying to figure out who would deliver some of these programs. Um, it's very difficult in a system that already exists um, with, you know, entities that have really specific functions. And if we're talking about um, a system like childcare that has many regulatory agencies and different bodies that deliver different things, it's very hard to determine like who does what. Um, and this is not you know, something that we take on as an organization, but we really want this to be um, something that is taken on by the state. And so trying to figure out how to work within that um, is definitely a barrier. It's definitely been a challenge in figuring out like that third party partner or someone to collaborate with um, in order to deliver some of these projects has been a, a challenge. Thanks. I think Adam, are you next to wrap things up? Yes, thank you, uh, Claremont um, and Anna. And thank you as well, uh, CC, Drew and Italo, both for for, their, for sharing your thoughts um, today. Also, thank you for your leadership out there. Uh, we were really glad to, um, to hear from you and to benefit. Um, I would also ask that if you, if you have any examples of proposals um, or any resolutions that have come out of your respective jurisdictions as a result of your advocacy that you would be willing to share, it would be great. I know some of the, the community work that I have been involved in in, um, in Fayetteville, we, we'd love to be able to see those examples and, and share them. So please do send those to maybe Alexandra or myself and, um, and we can share them uh, with others who might be interested in, in replicating some of your, uh, your ideas. Um, so again, thank you very much for sharing today. And you know, before we depart, uh, Jan, Alexandra, if you are able to share in the chat, it might be a good opportunity just to lift up the resource um, that we have put together from a number of different um, sources on the American Rescue Plan that's on the AHEAD NC website. So I, if you get a second, Alexandra, maybe to drop that into the chat that would be great. Um, we can also send it around as a follow-up, but included in that um, resource is some uh, 
some items from the Southern Economic Advancement Project or SEEP. And there is a model resolution to help communities uh, build an inclusive process in the decision-making on uh, affordable rescue, um, I'm sorry, American Rescue Plan dollars. And I think that would be a great thing to be able to share with uh, uh, our respective networks. The other thing to lift up is, thank you, there's the um, uh, SEEP uh, toolkit there. And the other thing is just the BTC analysis of uh, funding coming both to the state, also local jurisdictions, as well as uh, issue specific areas such as education. There's a lot of dollars moving in different directions. And so that resource would be um, great for you and maybe others in your network who might want to look in a detailed fashion at which dollars or how much are coming to their communities. Um, and thank you, Alexandra, for placing those things in the chat. You know, I, uh, again, want to say thank you to our presenters and everyone who helped put this event together today. Uh, we will likely follow up with um, an email to those who registered here in short order that would include uh, a link of the recording of this conversation um, and keep an eye out as well for our, our next forum. It will likely be in January or, or February. And if there's a, um, a particular subject that you feel strongly, you know, we should consider covering, you know, please reach out to me or Alexandra or really anyone at the Justice Center and share your thoughts on, on what that should be as we look to continue the conversation on equitable economic development. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, unless anyone has any other parting thoughts, I will, uh, I'll conclude us here. Thank you, everyone. Be well.